Right, there's a gentleman in the middle of that row, well, the black crew neck on. And just uh, so that we all know, if you could just say your name and if you represent any organisation, please say which it is, so that everybody knows where you might be coming from. Um, I'm Patrick Morgan. I'm a member of the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. On behalf of the organisation, I would like, first of all, to welcome Jeremy back to Belfast. Uh, we were glad to have him two years ago as a speaker at Palestine Day, um, which will be on again tomorrow. Um, my question to the panel, and to everyone on the panel, is that given the continuing slaughter of the people in Palestine, I mean, with over 2,000 people killed last summer, over 500 of those were children. Um, last week with an 18 month old baby who uh, was burned to death by an Israeli settler. There's been a total destruction of the infrastructure. Thousands of people are still displaced from their homes. Yeah, I think, I think we, we know the background. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you have a question? This question is, can the panel give hope to the people of Palestine by supporting the movement for boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel? <laughs> Noel and uh, good evening everyone, it's a pleasure to be here with you to see so many uh, turned out and uh, I'm humble enough to recognise it's not for me or Owen or Lula, um, but it is a privilege to be here. I think it was Patrick Morgan, is it pa Patrick? Yeah, Patrick, thanks for the question. I, uh, I approach uh, the Middle East, Israel and um, Palestine with a, a huge deal of caution. Uh, one, because it's very easy from Northern Ireland perspective and we've seen it over the last number of uh, years how people from one side or another here seem to associate themselves with one side uh, or another uh, in Palestine and Israel. I don't think that's helpful and I don't think it does a service to the issues. Uh, your question, in my view, is incredibly unbalanced. Uh, and whilst I don't um, take away uh, one bit uh, from the individual atrocities you've mentioned, there was no mention at all uh, of rocket attacks in Israel. Uh, there was no mention uh, at all uh, of the fright and the fear uh, and the threat of death, uh, persecution and annihilation uh, that Israel feels. And I think if you're going to find a suitable solution, uh, if you're going to find a workable solution, then you've got to recognize that it doesn't just cut one way. Uh, so that's the way I approach uh, Israel and Palestine. And I do believe Israel has uh, a right uh, to exist uh, as a country. Uh, I do believe that people on both sides uh, have the ability and should have the ability to live uh, free from the fear of attack. Uh, free from the fear that they will lose their lives simply for existing. Uh, and, you know, so I don't see it as cut and dry. I don't see it as one side being wholly good and the other side uh, so wrong. offering hope to the people of both countries, not hope to the Palestinians. Absolutely, and I think any solution is going to take recognition of that. Uh, not simply from one side, but recognizing that there is more than one argument to be had there, that it's been an intractable issue for the last 60 years uh, or more. And, and how might about. you offer that hope? Well, I know that uh, many have tried, so I'm not going to provide the answer, uh, I suspect, and I'm not sure that uh, many in the Middle East will be listening to what I have to say. But I think if you start from the premise uh, that there has been loss on both sides, uh, that it isn't as easy as the question suggests, and that not only one part of the community suffers, then I think you're on a better road to finding that solution. Thanks, Gavin. Jeremy, you have said that it's important to talk to everybody in the Middle East. Yes. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to West Belfast. I'm really pleased to be here, and I hope I can come again in the future. Um, on the, the issue, I've been nine times to Palestine and Israel over m many, many years. And uh, I know people on all sides of opinion in both Israel and in Palestine. And I was most recently in Gaza, and the sheer levels of destruction in Gaza are quite unbelievable, where people are living amongst rubble, families trying to survive, are under siege, and living with um, supplies coming from the UN, and r really no functioning economy whatsoever. People on the West Bank finding themselves under occupation, finding an increase in the number of settlements. There are now half a million settlers in the, in the West Bank. And the development of the wall around the West Bank uh, means that many farmers lose access to their land and the levels of anger are quite palpable and quite unbelievable. I was, um, when I was last in, um, in Gaza, during the time I was there, 
there was a house demolished by an F-16 jet. I don't know why, I don't know what the purpose for it was, all I know is during the night an F-16 jet came in, destroyed that house, killed all the members of the family except two that were outside the building at the time, and I went into the building the next day and the remaining edge of the building, the clock had stopped at the point where the bomb landed. Horrific and awful. Reason? I know not. But what I do know is that um, there has to be some kind of peace process. And that peace process has to be strong, robust and inclusive. The European Union and Israel have a trade agreement and that trade agreement includes a human rights clause. That human rights clause is being breached. It's being breached where children are in prison. It's being breached by the occupation. It's being breached by the imprisonment of elected parliamentarians from Gaza and from the West Bank. And uh, I think consequences should follow from that. Therefore, there is already some restriction, very limited restriction, on arms purchases and arms supplies. I think the um, boycott campaign, divestment campaign, is part and parcel of a legal process that has to be adopted. <laughs> I've met people from all sides in this, and there's an example here in Northern Ireland. A peace process came about here because there was recognition of the traditions of all communities, and that peace process, uneven, difficult, complicated, problematic, but still there and in action. I think there has to be that same process involving all sides. That's why I've met people with whom I do not share many of their social values, but I do recognise the political support that they have, and I think one has to do that. And what, Can cons I what consequences, Jeremy, for the people who are firing rockets in Israel, and wouldn't care how many they killed if they did kill them? Well, a ceasefire was agreed at the um, end of um, Operation Protective Edge. That ceasefire came about because of proximity talks that were held in Egypt. That surely is a starting point. The British Parliament voted for the recognition of Palestine on a non-binding motion. Most European parliaments have done the same. Surely there has to be recognition of the rights of Palestinian people, but also recognise that uh, there are people in Israel who, yes, do support the um, occupation and do support the continued bombardment of Gaza, but there are also very large numbers of people in Israel, 10,000, who turned out on demonstrations opposing the bombing and want to live in peace with their neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> now, the solution, that's the hope lies. The hope lies, I think, in Israel recognising it's got to live within the 1967 borders. The hope lies in the recognition of Palestine will lead us forward on this. The hope lies in the liberation of people to lead their own lives. I've certainly gone so long, but let's conclude with yeah. this thought. I have um, spent a lot of time in Gaza and the West Bank talking to young people. It might surprise you to know the highest level of graduates anywhere in the world are in Palestine. You have a very well-educated population. The education system, primarily UN, but others as well, is actually very good. Think of the hopelessness of living under siege, can't work, can't travel, can't do anything other than vicariously see the rest of the world through a computer or a TV screen. Those young people deserve hope and deserve opportunity. People denied hope and opportunity end up in often very, very bad places. It's up to the rest of the world to recognise that you've got to encourage them back to the negotiating table. And I believe that um, sanctions against Israel because of its breach of the trade agreement are the appropriate way of promoting that peace process. And that's what my view Yes. <laughs> um, Gavin said it wasn't, uh, it didn't cut one way, but you could say David and Goliath didn't exactly cut just one way either. But that's about the best. <laughs> yes, pretty much everything he said, basically. <laughs> I agree with everything he said. I think I'll be enough. saying that a lot. Fair enough, fair enough. And I just said, with you. <laughs> and your peril. Um, I'm delighted to be sitting. Can you all see that I'm to the left of Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, there's not many good say that. Uh, like, oh.
Unfortunately, of course, Mula is to Jeremy's right from the point of view of the audience, but that's a, a separate issue. Yeah, but we do, we do. We to, do. to answer Patrick's question, Stage left. one of the things when, when many of us have the privilege of meeting uh, activists from uh, Palestine, they tell us that people in this city and people right across Ireland are already giving them hope. And what I'd say to everybody here, and you know this from your own experience, every time you mobilise in this community, every time you protest White Line out on the Falls or Town Road, every time you organise lobbying campaigns, or you take a decision to boycott in your own life, you are giving people in Gaza and the West Bank hope. And that's not me saying it, that is what they tell us. And in fact, one of the things they say again and again is how remarkable the level of solidarity from people in Ireland is. Uh, often not matched, unfortunately, by the actions uh, of the government in Dublin, particularly, as Jeremy pointed out, in relation to the EU-Israel trade agreements. So what I'd say is, first of all, we need to keep doing what we're doing. And we need to do more of it, particularly to force our governments at the EU level uh, to take the action that's uh, required. The one thing I suppose I'll, I'll disagree with Gareth is this, uh, and Nuna put it right, this isn't a David and Goliath battle. And that's why boycott and divestment is so important. Because when you have so a you conflict... So you mean it is a David and Goliath battle? It absolutely yeah. is a David and Goliath battle. Apologies. Uh, and is that... <laughs> this, is the, this is the consequence of nerves in such a big crowd, hopefully I'll set it after a while. But this is why this campaign is so important, because for a group of people who have so few international allies among the powerful, what we need to ensure is the mass of ordinary people use every bit of power we have to support them in their struggle for something very basic the right to live, the right to work, the right to control their own destiny. And I have to say, for all of those people involved in that boycott and divestment campaign, they deserve our support, encouragement, and we need to keep that campaign up until it achieves its objectives. And what do you say to the people who fire the rockets into Israel? I think they should stop. But I also think that if you're serious about a peace process, then we need to see genuine dialogue around the table. And I think the difficulty for people, for example, living in the appalling conditions of the Gaza Strip is not only is there no peace process, but they're faced with an Israeli government that every single day is further undermining the most basic human conditions and basic human dignity. So if you want rockets from Gaza to stop, there's a very simple uh, uh, response. Stop the actions of the Israeli government in terms of their treatment of Palestinians, their expansion of settlements, and get them around the table to talk. That's the best way to stop and, violence. And, 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 and from recognize any side the right of Israel east. to exist? I have absolutely no difficulty. No Put difficulty with that. Through the chair, please. Through the chair, please. Through the chair, please, Mayor. No difficulty with that at all, but <coughs> our friend here is absolutely right. Israel exists. Israel is recognized by all of the powerful elites across the world. And what we are saying as ordinary citizens is all we want is the right for Palestine to exist and for the Palestinian people to live in peace and security uh, and I'm, human I'm, dignity. I'm, I'm, it's Gavin, a very basic I'm, demand. one against three here, I'm going to give you a... What, uh, what's your response to what you've heard? I guess the latter part of uh, Patrick's question was about boycott, and it seems to have, uh, Jeremy's described it as a legitimate uh, form of protest uh, uh, against Israel. Owen is delighted that so many people uh, in Palestine are encouraged by the solidarity shown by people here in Belfast and across uh, Ireland. I can assure you that not one thing is achieved for the people of Palestine when uh, those in solidarity go into Castle Court and turn over a cosmetic stand because uh, the products happen to have ingredients from the Dead Sea. Nothing is achieved from that at all. How many people here have iPhones? How many people here have iPhones? I suspect uh, the vast majority of people in this room have iPhones uh, filled with components made uh, in Israel. Throw them ahead of the floor, please. If, if, if you have a family member, you yourself are uh, experiencing treatment at the moment for cancer, you will find that that drug uh, that your, yourself or your family member may have been taken has been developed in Israel. Uh, so these boycotts have effects. And if you think that it is sensible to turn your nose on cancer treatment, to turn your nose on high-tech ophthalmic care, to turn off your iPhones, you will achieve nothing. You will achieve nothing, you will damage those around you, and you will not advance the cause of Palestine. Okay. Okay. It's a new question. Um, pragmatic politics. Yeah. So that's the area we'll move in. And we now get the electorate, apparently, to... Um, I'm sorry, we now get the, the politicians that are meant to reflect what the, the electorate um, wants. 
Now, I'm just wondering um, how could the DUP take the courageous step of moving its politics a little bit beyond just mere reaction? Um, and part of its political lexicon is, from my experience, is usually no. Uh, just uh, I, that's one I'm going to. Sinn Fein, I'm wondering um, if uh, they or if you could move the politics on here beyond the, the entrenchment that the Good Friday Agreement has done, uh, which is to rely on a veto. It's, it could be argued that in relying on that veto, you are in many ways accepting the sectarian structures that are part of these six counties. I'm just going to ask, if you and everyone try to make a question to question rather than a treatise that gets us through more, more bits. So if you'd have a, that's two questions, one for each of them. Yeah, well, yeah. it's the same question to each. All right, so, Owen. Well, I haven't finished with the... Oh, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I think you've had enough. I think we get the, we get the gist. Thank you. So, go ahead, Owen. Uh, I don't recognise, I suppose, the accusation in, in the first and the second part of your question in the sense that almost everything that Sinn Féin has been trying to do, both in the lead up to the Belfast Agreement and since with our attempts to, to secure its full implementation, is the very opposite of veto politics. It is all about trying to build new relationships, either with uh, former opponents in the DUP. Well, the the so well, let's get right down to it. Welfare reform. You accepted it, then you rejected it. Sure, Why not accept it? Let, uh, but don't give, we don't need a history. Me, we don't have time for you know, the whole history. We could, Welfare reform, if you accept that it, it would put the Storm Prize Agreement sure. and the peace process back on course, some suggest. No, you're more than welcome to answer the question for me. Mm. That makes it easier for no, no, no. <laughs> So the question I was first of all asked by the gentleman and then I'll come to your question, which is related to it. So the first thing is this, and welfare reform is a very good example of it. In all of our efforts, what Sinn Féin is trying to do is to get away from veto politics, to build new relationships and to resolve problems. And for two years, we were engaged in detailed discussions and negotiations, not only with our friends in the DUP, but also with the British Treasury and the British Government to try and resolve uh, the issue of welfare reform. There are mountains of paper or proposals tabled by Sinn Féin time and time again. Uh, Noel is absolutely wrong, uh, although I'm not surprised in that, to say that we accepted welfare reform and then rejected it, then accepted and then rejected it again. The I issue didn't is say this, that. I said you accepted it, then rejected it. The issue is this. Is what you did do. Is that we are against taking money out of the pockets of the poorest people in our society. And for two years, we have been trying to reach an agreement on how to avoid that. We thought we had reached an agreement with Stormont Castle, there was a financial package put in place, and that financial package met our conditions of protecting those people in greatest need in our society. It's not Sinn Féin has walked away from that agreement, much and all as there are parts of it that are very difficult for us. It is the DUP who have reneged on the financial commitments. And until we get back around the table and deal with the substantive issue of welfare reform, which is impact on the poorest in our society, its impact on the domestic economy, and the fact that no political party in this part of Ireland has a mandate to introduce those types of savage cuts uh, on our community, then this debate isn't going anywhere. So Sinn Féin isn't using a veto, we want to solve this problem, but Tory cuts, including the increased Tory cuts okay. that David Cameron is now looking to introduce, are not good for so, anybody. So and we are no proud to pragmatism say, is all about principle. Okay. We want to find a solution, absolutely. The difficulty is, is that the solution cannot be pushing more people into poverty. It simply makes no sense. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. um, it's all your fault. The DUP won't move. Oh, no, it's all David Cameron's fault. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that in a moment. Um, well, I was going to respond to the gentleman first, but then I was fearful that if I was uh, negative in my response, that would be yet another no. Uh, so I'm not going to provide that for you. I have to say, I think uh, you're getting a huge level of disservice from the politics you've just heard there about welfare reform. It's easy to treat people uh, like fools. Uh, and that is what I believe you're getting uh, in the current discourse around welfare reform. Because pragmatic politics means that you go back to the first agreement uh, that we had with Martin McGuinness. And you were right the first time, Noel, it was once agreed, then withdrawn, then agreed again at Stormont House, and then withdrawn yet again. As if we, in some way, provide a surplus uh, to the United Kingdom. As if we operate within this uh, great utopia where money is not 
an issue. So pragmatic politics, sir, uh, involves rebalancing uh, this economy. But pragmatic politics also means that we have to operate uh, yeah. within but, our but means. And you, I say but within our means. Said, but you and Sinn Féin equally want to protect the most vulnerable in society. Absolutely. They are doing it by opposing austerity. You're doing it by accepting it. Well, in protecting... In, in, Don't you realise that in not implementing welfare reform, the most vulnerable in our society are hurting already? Don't you realise that decisions that hamper uh, progress within the Northern Ireland Executive as a direct consequence of not having cash available is hurting the most vulnerable? Do you realise that it took an additional five months to tell people within our early year sector that money would be available for them to continue? Do you not think that those most disadvantaged young people within our society deserve those levels of services within early years and the money wasn't available because we're getting fined two million pounds every and, and, and week? Why aren't, you, why aren't you making the case that Martin McGuinness is making that Northern Ireland is a special case and needs more money? One. Because there's only so many times you can make those same arguments. I mean, Jeremy uh, made some comments, and I'm not attacking him on this, but he made some comments uh, either today or yesterday about welfare reform uh, and what is required. What was agreed at Stormont House was the best welfare package available in the United Kingdom, better than the Scots have and the SNP have implemented, which is better than what uh, we have in England and Wales uh, through Westminster. And the £300 million, pounds, which isn't a, a great sum uh, in a UK context, but in a Northern Ireland context, that uh, hardship fund uh, that was agreed as through Stormont House is there to remove the excesses of Tory austerity cuts. That's real politics. That's pragmatic politics. And whether people want to keep putting their head in the sand and not accept it for as long as they do that, they continue to hurt uh, the most vulnerable. Okay. The Department of Education, Nolan, I think you conducted this interview uh, last week, have been faced with a proposition that rather uh, than give uh, those children in primary one to primary three uh, in most need uh, free school meals, that actually there is great benefit for every child in primary one to primary three. DE won't even consider it. Won't even consider it because whilst they continue to fund some pet projects, they refuse to accept that actually one month's worth of fines would adequately cover something that would drastically change their opportunities and life experience. Gavin, yeah, thanks. Uh, pragmatism. What do you think about pragmatism as a political philosophy? Well, life, life is pretty pragmatic in many ways, how you go through things, but I think you have to approach things from the point of view of a principle as well. And uh, on the issues of uh, welfare reform, the bill that's now before Parliament and the budget that's now before Parliament, first of all, takes benefits away from the children of larger families, the third child onwards loses out. It takes £12 billion out of the welfare budget as a whole. It um, puts in a welfare cap in, of 23,000 in London, 20,000 outside of London, and uh, it knowingly and quite deliberately is going to cut into the living standards of some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society. And I have... Um, Sorry, Joan, I'm going to ask you with the benefit of Harriet Harman said there was a feeling in the... I was going to give you a long answer, actually. No, no, you want a short one? Well, let's have a few short ones. Okay, okay, short. Uh, I'm sorry, so too long. Harriet Harman said that there was, a, there was an appetite in the nation for a welfare cap. A lot of people think £23,000 if you're not employed and you have a family, which is well up there with the average industrial wage for people who are out working 40 hours a week, is a fair thing. What do you think? Can I tell you this? I represent an inner London constituency where because of the combination of high unregulated rents, a welfare cap that's being imposed, families, yes, are receiving some, not very many families, 25000 now 23000 a year. Are oh, they living the life of Riley as a result of it? Absolutely not. None of the people who are working for that. that no, wait a minute. That money goes straight to the landlord. And because the rents have gone up so much further, we are now undertaking in Britain the social cleansing of central London and many other cities by this cap. We need to stop having a welfare system that subsidises high rents and low wages and make sure it actually does something to benefit the needs of the very poorest and most vulnerable people. <laughs> with Harriet on this when they say there's... You lost uh, the election. 
There is an appetite in the country for well, that kind of policy. We don't know the reasons of why everybody voted the way they did. I would suspect that one of the reasons we didn't win the election was that we were not offering something clear enough as an alternative to what is. the welfare issue, there is also the way in which people with disabilities have been treated, the way in which the availability for work tests have been done, the people that have taken their own lives in desperation when they've been passed as fit for work when they're clearly not. And also this whole language, the language of some of the media, of blaming everyone that exercises their right to claim a benefit, a social security benefit. Can't we live in a society where we're proud to have health care as a human right free at the point of use, can't we also be proud of the idea of a society that does prevent anyone falling into destitution rather than forcing people into destitution? You've yeah, spoken sure. about people's quantitative easing, I think is the term you used. Yes, of course, yeah. And uh, the, the criticism of that is you're talking about uh, reduce the deficit through increased investment, public spending. People say that brings higher inflation, higher interest rates, which hit poorer people. Well, quantitative easing paid into banks apparently is of nil effect to the rest of the community. I'm suggesting that instead of quantitative easing paid into banks, instead we use that as a point of start, not the point of end, the point of start of a national investment bank that can improve infrastructure throughout the UK, that can also invest in high-tech manufacturing, high-technology high green industries, which I think we need far more of. We have too many highly qualified graduates all over who are not able to find work because we have an unbalanced economy where we've done far too much in the direction of financial services and far too little in the direction of manufacturing industry and what the skills that we traditionally have are. That's why I'm suggesting in this National Investment Bank. You can't cut your way to prosperity by the process of austerity, cutting public expenditure, you end up reducing tax income, you end up borrowing more because the tax income goes down, you then cut further, you go into a cycle of economy has recovered, and many say the UK's economy has recovered well, as a result of austerity. And look at the levels of poverty and the suffering that has gone alongside that. All four of us. Though. Right, Linda here in the, in the second row there. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Noel. Uh, hello. My question is directed towards Gavin Robinson. Um, as a barrister and a lawmaker, I just wondered, um, Gavin brought up the point about people in um, Castle Court having protests. I just wondered what Gavin's view was on Trillal Avenue, um, because there's a protest been going on there for two years that's actually cost £23 billion. Pounds. And we're talking about austerity. He's in Westminster. How does he actually stand there when they talk about um, austerity measures and saving money? And he knows that £23 million have been wasted in Twiddell Avenue. Money that could have gone to his constituents, constituents all over Northern Ireland, for um, hip operations, heart operations. We all have parents, we all have people who need health care. And this money is being wasted. I just wondered what his view was on that. Yeah. I guess it takes us back to uh, the very first question on how you approach these things. My answer to it is a five minute parade. A five minute parade. Uh, the ability, the, 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 sorry, uh, the, uh, sorry, I know because I'm allowed to talk now, you see that's the idea. Um, if you were challenging, you see, you see. <laughs> this is what and happens. The answer to it could be a five minute parade. And the answer to it could be people Please. accepting that actually, even though they may be entirely intolerant, uh, that others within our society have a right to exist and to express themselves as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well you, you've asked him the question, I think he's answered it. Isn't... Yeah, the lady here. Uh, sorry, the lady in the multicoloured uh, dress. But I have a question that's really about the equality agenda. I mean, we're sitting here, it's nearly 47 years since the 5th of October 1968, and what I would date as the first civil rights march. Yet we're still in Northern Ireland living the least equal part of these islands. We have no equal marriage, we have a gay blood ban, uh, women don't have the right to choose, and most crucially of all, 
up for the 500 or so members of the Labour Party of Northern Ireland. We can't stand for election here. I'd like to ask everybody what you would say to us to progress the equality agenda for the North of Ireland here. Jeremy. Well, the equality agenda that's been developed um, across some parts of the UK and some parts of Ireland is very welcome. I have always supported um, uh, homosexual law reform, I supported gay marriage and I was very proud when it finally went through Parliament and I thought that was an enormous step forward. And I remember a time when I was first elected to Parliament we went through what was called Section 28 then which was where local authorities were fined or penalised or banned from allowing any gay organisation to use a public place. Some of the MPs that voted for that ended up being sufficiently well educated over the subsequent 25 years that they ended up voting for equality of marriage legislation. I thought that was a huge and enormous step forward. I remember when uh, during the miners strike for the first time gays and lesbians against pit closures turned out on a march alongside a group of miners that had come from Yorkshire and I, I thought that was absolutely fascinating and absolutely brilliant when people realised that when you're being badly treated when you're being discriminated against, you can make common cause with other people, even though you might not fully understand what they were doing at the beginning. That brings about real solidarity. And so I would want to see the, hopefully, and I hope this can be agreed, an extension of the equalities legislation that we received in the UK Parliament to all parts of the UK. That is my position. I feel very, very strongly uh, about that. I realise there are sensitivities. I realise people don't always agree with that. I've been through many debates with people in my own constituency on it, but I think if you engage in an open and honest debate, you can make progress on it. Thank you very much for your question. <laughs> Well, putting up candidates here. The Labour Party does not organise candidates in elections in Northern Ireland, as you know, and that is a decision that has been repeatedly made at uh, party conferences and the National Executive. And as far as I know, there are no plans to change that at the moment. There is obviously. When you're a leader. Well, it, leaders aren't dictators, and certainly if I was, I would not be a dictator. That would be a decision that would be made by the party, but I do not detect any great wish. Um, in, in the party in the rest of the UK. I'm not saying it's not here, elsewhere, to um, organise in Northern Ireland. And, and you don't see that as a denial of democracy? I see that as a decision that's been made by the party. I see it as a question of a debate, and I have no problem with continuing to have that debate What's that your discussion. own view? My own view is that I would not, but I'm prepared to be open to that discussion and that debate. Okay. Gavin. <coughs> Just maybe as a follow-on yeah. to that, and also my sure. job to ask questions of others as well, but if you have them or Jeremy, do people in Northern Ireland have a right to vote in the leadership election? Yes, they do. Yeah, members of the party. Yes, they do. Yes, they do, have, they do have that right. Members in Northern Ireland, there are several hundred of them, do have a right. And obviously, those that are union affiliates who have uh, their unions paying political levy, they have a right to vote as well. So they're not denied in that. Okay. Yeah. So on the wider issue, uh, the equality agenda. Yeah. Um, again, it's a bit like the uh, the anti-austerity uh, discussion. Uh, and I thank you, Captain, for the question. I think it's important. Uh, and I think uh, I would greatly welcome the Labour Party having the opportunity to, to stand, to mobilise and to seek votes in elections, the same way that the Conservatives do. And I wouldn't be averse to that mainland uh, discussion taking place here in Northern Ireland. And I think there's a contribution uh, there to be made, so uh, continue uh, with it. Um, and when I mentioned that the austerity, I think it's easy to talk about equality in a broad term as if it's catch-all and uh, it means whatever it is you want it to mean. Um, well, we're on a step on equal marriage, for example. What about equal marriage in Northern Yeah, Ireland? and whether it's equal marriage or whether it's uh, right to choose or whatever, it's a reflection of the democratic will of people in Northern Ireland. Uh, whenever the question's raised, it's as if the Northern Ireland Assembly hasn't had the opportunity to discuss these issues since its inception. It has, uh, and yet it still hasn't changed. So if we value uh, devolution, if we value the ability of people in Northern Ireland to choose their representatives to decide for them on these issues, uh, then we should respect, uh, in my view, the outcome. Uh, I was interested, you mentioned um, the gay blood ban uh, uh, as an example. Uh, I personally am encouraged that Simon Hamilton, as Health Minister, has indicated that he will make a decision which is science-led and science-led uh, alone. Uh, and I do hope that people who are uh, motivated by that issue uh, will take some comfort from those indications from our health minister, but also to recognise uh, that uh, should he believe uh, that those who uh, are involved in MSN 
to, uh, are able to donate blood. That doesn't mean necessarily that you can, uh, but uh, if you're active, then there'll be a, a one-year ban rather than a lifetime ban. I think it's an important. But do you think we're moving forward? Issue. The question clearly implies that we aren't. Well, they're, they're, we're moving forward on that issue. And the right to choose, and I know that's another one. And, you know, uh, Jeremy can uh, reflect this. We, there's, there must be an amazing system out there somewhere that allows people to drop their name and their address into a, a, a pre-formed email, and you get a uh, continuous lobby on a daily basis of hundreds of these emails. And right to choose. Uh, is one of them. Um, but it's not my party that has a position on that. Every party in Northern Ireland has a particular view on the extension of the 1967 Abortion Act to Northern Ireland. And nobody wants to see it. Uh, and that is a reflection of devolution. That is a reflection of having local politics at work here in Northern Ireland. And what is democracy if that's not an outcome? It's a good thing. Okay. No, no. Um, unequal marriage, the polls that have been conducted um, after the big rally at the City Hall showed that um, 60, somebody will keep me right, 68% of the population uh, agree with equal marriage. Most of us have no As problem. does Trevor Lunn, a converted alliance. Trevor party. Lunn is a alliance uh, representative who changed his mind and I was there the other night and he was saying about that. I was at a, a debate or a talk about where next or what, what we do next about marriage equality. It will come. Of course it will come. We do things a few years behind everybody else in Northern Ireland. It is going to come. Um, the right to choose. Um, the people who oppose Mary Stokes Clinic and who attack people going into that, they represent people who, as far as I can see, believe in a right to birth. Or, or believe in the sanctity of birth, um, not so evident when those children are born, uh, that they're going to be there to look after those children. The, the fundamental problem for me is that religion and politics are too infused here. It's like the marriage thing. <laughs> I don't understand why the media allows people to talk about the religious elements of uh, gay uh, relationships in relation to marriage because what people are talking about is civil marriage. It has absolutely nothing to do with religion. You throw whatever crosses and water around you want, it's got nothing to do with it. The same thing applies to abortion. If we could take the heat, nobody has an abortion like, like it is not a lifestyle choice. I would uh, propose that it is not a lifestyle choice that anybody would make. Once again, it is people thinking that because I believe this, and I have been, I was quite Christian when I was a teenager, you know, with that weird phase of your life. But, when you were working for Spotlight, didn't you? Just before Spotlight. Uh, but, and I, used to, I actually stood on the streets of Dublin witnessing to Christ. God forgive me. But, and I have a problem with that, you know, People here say, oh, well, you know, at least you know we are with fundamentalism. Yeah, you're up oh, shit creek without a paddle. Let's it. It not... The politics that served us with everybody slinging insults across and the background that we have with the, the Protestant faith being hellfire and brimstone, grand. But there is a time to move on and say civil society is not represented by uh, religious minorities and it's time to take religion out of schools, out of education, out of everything and leave it there. <laughs> well, on marriage equality, surprisingly, I actually agree with Gavin. Because what he said was, That's what I love about West Belfast. Marriage, marriage equality should be about the democratic will of the parties in the north of Ireland. Now, what that means is if a majority of MLAs voted for marriage equality, then we should have marriage equality. And maybe I have my facts wrong, but a majority of MLAs, or a larger number of MLAs, voted for it in the last vote than against it. So what, what the DUP should do is they should withdraw their... Let, let me just clear that. I can't remember. Yeah, my, it, it is not true. Uh, just to be entirely clear, on each occasion this has come before the Assembly, a petition of concern has been signed, but it has been unnecessary. So, unnecessary. Uh, okay. so, 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 no, no, hold on, hold on. Well, that's, that, that's Owen's talking now. It's so, not and this, yeah. this, this leads to my second point. What Gav Gavin's party should do is withdraw the threat of the petition of concern and allow the Assembly, by a straight democratic majority vote, to vote on this issue. And I've no doubt that if the Assembly did that, we would have the marriage equality that exists everywhere else on the island of Ireland uh, uh, and across 
at the water on that island on the other side of it. And one of the really <laughs> profound things, one of the really profound things about the marriage equality debate in the South uh, is that, in fact, we're much more backward down South than you guys are up here. And lots of people thought at the outset of that debate that this wasn't going to happen. That people's gut, conservative, as Nuna said, almost kind of religious ethos, would on the day prevent it from happening. Something much more dramatic happened. There was a level of debate, not just about whether or not lesbian and gay couples would have the same right to civil marriage as straight couples, but about equality. About actually what would it mean if we extended equality to a broader range of subjects and a broader range of matters in our society. And the message I say to you is this, and it's directly in relation to Catherine's question. When I moved back down south nine years ago, one of the things that struck me is actually the equality movement here in the north, right across the communities, is far stronger, is far clearer, and far better mobilised than it is down south. And yet, if we're able to achieve what we're able to achieve with marriage equality there, if we keep doing what we've been doing up here, we will get that vote through in the assembly. We will have marriage equality, and we will so, be able to advance some, the Somebody Google the figures. I can't so important, important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Campaign against plastic bullets. We just had a vigil there, and uh, we do it every every failure event, commemorating the 17 people murdered by plastic bullets, including nine children, the youngest only 10 years of age. Now we were hoping, you know, of late that uh, not many plastic bullets were fired. And I want to thank Jeremy for inviting us over to the House of Commons a couple of years ago, and we introduced the whole issue of plastic bullets. But plastic bullets were fired two weeks ago. Five of them were fired up in, uh, up in Woodville. We in the campaign don't want them fired on the Falls, or the Shankill, or North Belfast. <laughs> the panel feel about the issue of plastic bullets, given that Chris Patton's recommendations have never been Im implemented when he said they should be done away with and a safer alternative found. Thanks, sir. Just a, a quick one on that, everyone. Go ahead. Ban them and ban them now. Yeah. Uh, right, uh, plastic bullets. Sorry, thank you. I'd be interested to hear from Claire what the, uh, the alternative uh, could be. Um, because one of the biggest, and I, I think there are many. Uh... <laughs> 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 okay, let him answer. Let him answer the question, please. Thank you through the chair. I'm not sure what your problem is, but I can tell you this: plastic bullets are used, and, and, I, and I appreciate this entirely in the context of your campaign, where people have died as a result of their use. But they are used as a non-lethal alternative to actual bullets. <laughs> Listen to me. I accept entirely in the context of the Navy's campaign, and I think it is. I mean, it is an outrage that people have been killed with these plastic bullets, but they are used and authorised. I'm not sure if you're prepared to listen to me or not, sir. Yeah, but they are used speak, as a non-lethal alternative to actual bullets. So, whenever I mean, look around the world. Look around the world, the conflict situations. We have a very unique way of policing civil uh, disorder in Northern Ireland. And in fact, a lot of people come here uh, to find out how best uh, it should be done. Water cannon is one non-lethal uh, method, but it has its severe limitations, and it was banned uh, by the Home Secretary in the House of Commons a number of weeks ago. But not for, here. For England, for, 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 well, for London yeah. uh, particularly, but for England uh, and Wales. So whenever somebody sits here and says uh, to Claire, you respectfully, or to you, sir, uh, that they're interested to hear what those other alternatives are, because if we can get a non-lethal uh, uh, alternative, which is, in essence, actually non-lethal, then let's talk about it. But berating me because you don't like what I have to say isn't going to get us In the meantime, because your non-lethal means is lethal or can be lethal, Correct. should they be banned? Well, I think, look, yeah, so the, que the question is, yeah, we need an alternative, and, clearly the and, and Chris Patton said, get us an alternative. So, what, so you're waiting for a new the question. That's a discussion that I'm very prepared to have because what we need to have is equip uh, our PSNI officers, security forces in Northern Ireland and right throughout the UK and the world with ways in which they can suppress that civil disorder without putting people uh, at threat of losing uh, their life. I think that's a goal that we should be prepared uh, to get to. Right. Okay, let's talk about the details a little short, Jeremy. 
classic bullet. Classic bullets are lethal, do kill people and should not be banned and should be banned and not used at all. Likewise water cannon, which we've stopped being used on the streets of London because of the implications of it. Given that there are street disturbances, what, what should well, the, 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 the security There have been do. very serious street disturbances in London yeah. at various times, and you have to have intelligent policing, but you also have to look at the motivation and the causes for them, and it is possible to bring about a sense of order and peace on the streets without using plastic bullets or uh, water cannon. If you do that, you're going to injure people, you're going to cause inflammation of the situation, it's going to get worse, not better. I have seen what happens to the victims of people that have been, uh, those that have had plastic bullets fired at them, just as much as the use of water cannon, and I think we should not have either. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. Uh, my name is Paul Gallagher, I'm Chairman of Victims and Survivors Trust. Just bring it back to maybe the, I had a meeting with um, some Israeli delegates a few months ago, and they seen themselves as the only victims and the, the Israeli-Palestinian situation couldn't see the, the Palestinians as being victims at all. And it sort of brings it back to the situation we have here with the recognition of victims here and the, the constant debate around trying to define victimhood. At the moment, it's sort of based on human suffering, really, is your is the definition of victimhood. But there seems to be a lot of uh, a drive towards changing that to just innocent victims. I wonder what the panel would think of, of that situation. Okay. Now, do you have a view on that? I'm sure you do. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so the question is... Well, uh, it's all about no, defining no, no, victims. How do we define a victim in, in Northern Ireland and elsewhere? Um, I don't know how politically correct it is to say it. I, I, I suppose I think a victim is somebody who defines themselves as a victim. Um, it's a problem when we get into you're more deserving than I am. I think we have collectively a huge problem in Northern Ireland that are, we, we tend to talk about the past, about you did this, I did that, they did that, they done me wrong, we done them wrong, etc. There is a massive psychological impact of the troubles on everybody. Some people lost lives, some people had family who lost lives and friends, don't need to rehearse it all here. But the rippling out of that has been well documented as well. But I don't think it's being talked about in a, a sort of, once again, drawing a line to some extent and saying, what do we do now? What do we do now to make mental health better? Because that's ultimately what you're talking about, emotional, mental, psychological well-being. Sometimes, yes, it is physical well-being, but that also is wrapped up, uh, you know, the quality of our life is what we're talking about. And I think the quality of life for people here in a lot of places across the board, but you know, concentrated in certain areas particularly, um, solutions are not going to the doctor and getting antidepressants and huge supermarkets you know, selling crappy junk food at very cheap prices, which leads to poor health, which, which puts pressure on the health service. I think as a whole, what we could do with the Northern Ireland is a positive attitude about how we move forward and I think again our politics does not reflect what most people here want which is something that is couched that we talk now we don't talk about uh, victims of rape we talk about survivors and I believe that language is very powerful we are survivors we do very well people do the best they can with what they have where they're at and I think Similarly to the uh, greater circumstances for uh, yeah. extra money from London, we need to have an acceptance. We have a higher rate of uh, tablet use, etc., etc. We know all that. Okay. And definitely, I think, yes, we need to have a more, uh, where do we go from here, talk about what victimhood really okay. means. Uh, Owen. Well, first I'm going to ask you all, please, to keep that brief. Imagine there's a lot of hands up there. I want to get through there. as many as I can. There, there is no single definition or single correct definition of what a victim or indeed a survivor of the conflict is. And I think, first of all, to accept that is part of, of the, the way out of the difficulty. While we have some groups of people, and particularly within the political classes, insisting on legitimate victims or innocent victims and those that aren't, we're always going to be in this difficulty. I think if there was less politicking of this, and if the process was more led by those directly affected, either as victims or survivors of the conflict, we might have more of a resolution. But crucially it's this, <coughs> all of those people who directly or indirectly came to harm or hurt or suffered during the conflict have to be accommodated through that process. 
There isn't going to be an agreed demand from those people as to what they need, and we have to take cognizance of that and try and find ways of meeting that. And for me, maybe the first step is take some of the party politics out of those definitions and allow those people most affected to really have control of that process so we get a better outcome for them and ultimately for society as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Noel. I guess uh, nobody would be surprised to hear that I have a slightly different interpretation from uh, Nula and, uh, and Owen who have uh, spoken on this. Um, we believe in support for victims, uh, not victim makers, and we do make a distinction uh, between those uh, who, through no fault of their own, uh, fell uh, susceptible to uh, attack, uh, to violence, to loss of life, to loss of property within their family. Uh, they are victims. Those who went out and carried out those atrocities can never, in my view, be considered uh, victim. Uh, and nor should they, and nor should, and nor should they benefit. Uh, there are an awful lot of people say that people who went into that area of work did so because they were victims, because they were victims of circumstances, because maybe members of their family had become victims in, in a real practical sense. Is there, is there no, no alliance in your philosophy for that kind of motivation? Well, I accept uh, absolutely that there are people that make uh, those arguments, um, but everyone makes a choice. Uh, everyone makes a choice in life, and I will not stand over anyone who chose to go out there and to kill or to maim or to injure or destroy people in this society. And I suspect, so we will go and I suspect on. sitting here, and I suspect sitting here tonight, nobody would support it today. Uh, but as we go back in the past, I wouldn't support it then either. So we will go on in this morass of not knowing who's a victim and who isn't a victim, and no one gets any help. Well, people do get help, and I think it's important that we're not. No, I think it's important that we're not facetious about uh, what is. Uh, a difficult issue in Northern Ireland. I'm glad that over the last, since 2007, uh, through both uh, our party and Sinn Féin, uh, the funding for victims in Northern Ireland has almost trebled. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's uh, encouraging. And those who need physical aids, for example, uh, those who need uh, financial support and assistance and guidance and counselling and therapies, they are able to avail uh, of those services. And I'm not saying that it's a perfect situation. I know many are disappointed with the level of support that they get. But it's, it's, it's more about philosophy than question. Jeremy, do you want to get into that snake pit? Very, very briefly. First of all, thank you for the question. I think it's a very good one and very important. Um, all of us can be victims of uh, mental health conditions. All of us need support. And as a society, we've got to be prepared to be much more open-hearted and recognise that all of us go through periods of trauma and stress. Whole societies go through periods of trauma and stress. A great friend of mine who sadly died last year was Helen Bamba, who was a young Jewish girl, went to Auschwitz in 1945, and she was so traumatised by what she saw, she was doing her best to support victims. She eventually founded the Medical Foundation with the Care of Victims of Torture, <clears throat> spent her whole life supporting victims of torture from all over the world, from all circumstances, from all walks of life. And it was, it, it was the therapy she did, the collective work she did, and I have a group in my area called Room to Heal, which is a collective group that come together. I meet them quite often, absolutely fascinating. These are people that have been through traumas in different parts of the world, mainly refugees, but also people that have been through abuse and trauma in London or in other places, and societies as a whole can go through trauma. So yes, we need two things. One is recognition, serious recognition, that we can all be traumatised by violence. We can all be victims of violence in various ways. And you do need the funding, the resources, the opportunities for talking but, but, therapy. But, 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 victims and victim makers in Gavin Robinson's terms. No, I don't, I don't, I, dif I differ with Gavin on that because I think everyone can be a victim in different circumstances and the way they're driven into a situation. Surely we need to bring society forward so we can accept these traumas together, move forward together, rather than going back into a black culture. Uh, Jim, I'm sorry. Any more for person? Yes, I'm just uh, very quickly. I would like the panel's view on the comments from uh, TD McWallace recently about NAMA and the, its northern portfolio, and specifically around the issue of land and property, and the possibility that there was widespread uh, corruption and misappropriation of funds. Uh, all right. Uh, that's, a, that's a big, big topic. Hey, you, you're obviously across. You know about Nama? Okay. Nula? Nama? No, 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 no. 
No, 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 Two words, two, two sentences each, please. Then we must move on. So many people can't. Well, you can't, you can't answer Jim's question in two sentences. Oh, so you're best. I'll do my very best. You will, you will, you will. And this isn't just a bit of political scandal. In terms of the property portfolio here in the north that was sold last year, 2,000 people are currently employed throughout that portfolio. Uh, and a very significant amount of revenue has been generated, unfortunately not for you guys here, but for the taxpayer down south, who of course spent so much of its money uh, bailing out some of these banks. The core of the problem here is that we have this thing called NAMA, which in two sentences I can't explain. Yeah, the bad but, bank. But we are not Three allowed to know what it does. Yeah. And when I say we, I don't just mean citizens. I mean a rockless members whose job is to scrutinise it. We also have both the Department of Finance in the Assembly and the Department of Finance in the South effectively refusing to fully cooperate with the Stormont Assembly Committee who is trying on your behalf to find out exactly what's going on with this. And at the core of the problem is a desire both by the government in Dublin and NAMA to fire sale assets of huge value without any uh, consideration to the impact on ordinary citizens or the taxpayers who footed the bill in the first place. So what I'd say to people is, in the very short time I have, while you might not get the full details of it, this affects all of us. Not just us in the South, it affects the people whose jobs are on the line here. And okay. of course, that's, that's, if, that's, if you that's, fire, if you fire sale something, <coughs> you can't adequately okay. protect the people Gavin. who need protected. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, I do suspect in the fullness of time that people will think this was uh, a lot to do about nothing. Uh, and given, no, I didn't, because I believe whenever, uh, whenever half truths and half baked ideas are out there are investigated, and the reality is shown, uh, it will not be anywhere near uh, the issue that has been created over this silly season. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, I think this issue is uh, suffering from a disservice. And even for Owen to uh, indicate that the Department of Finance uh, is not engaging with the inquiry, they've said this uh, that they can't. Uh, give information until they have a discussion uh, with the police. Now, I know politically that a lot of us have contact with the police. It's very easy to establish whether those questions are being asked, very easy to establish uh, whether those answers uh, and solutions have been sought, and then if somebody still fails to turn up, then you might be able to make uh, some suggestions about whether people are prepared to cooperate or not. But whatever happened to uh, due process, it seems as if everyone has decided what happened in this situation, yet the details and the facts are not there to support any of the uh, rumours, the innuendo and the scandal that's sitting out Thanks. Lady in the orange top is a great question. Hello, my name is Angela. I'm just a resident of West Belfast. I'm not in an organisation. And my question is completely different. But I didn't realise the abuse and trauma would connect it. Um, recently watching the television uh, by Ted Heath, um, it has really, really brought to mind about the victims of Kinkora. And Ted Heath might not be guilty of anything, don't let's walk on the grave of the dead. But for me, the media have brought out Ted Heath, who's dead, Cecil Smith, dead, and a Labour MP who has dementia, so someone who is not of sound mind. These people are being accused and they're dead. The victims of Kinkora are alive, maybe not so well, because yeah. they've got trauma and abuse. Jeremy, my question to you, hopefully you will be the Labour leader. And Gavin, you are in Westminster. Can you start putting pressure on the Tory government who every time the door opens that much for Kinkora, they get it slammed in their face. I think everyone in this right. room would agree okay. the victims right. of Kinkora are in need. The commission that's now been established to look into all the allegations of child abuse is a very important one and a very good step forward. It's taken a very long time to get there. My two concerns with it, and they're not that I'm against it, I'm absolutely not, are one that I think it needs greater investigative powers and greater investigative support and to be given the legal powers necessary to unearth any documents anywhere under any jurisdiction because there are issues surrounding the Channel Islands as well as, uh, as, well as all the parts 
of the UK. And um, secondly, that there is a, an issue that it could turn out to be almost a permanent com commission. Now, I raised this in Parliament with Theresa May. She kind of understood the point, and she felt that there ought to be immediate investigations on the outstanding queries that come up about children's homes in a number of places. But I think there is a case for saying there has to be a standing commission to investigate this. The trauma that victims of childhood sexual abuse go through, and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, has to be dealt with. And if there's cover-ups because the alleged perpetrator was a very prominent person at that time, well, the law should apply to everybody, whoever they are, absolutely equally. And, but we should also be very careful that uh, just by calling somebody an abuser is not the same thing as proof or evidence. The proof and the evidence has to be there before any final decision is made. Can I come in on that? And I think yeah, of I'm course. really pleased uh, that you have raised uh, the issue of Concora. Uh, I don't think Ted his name has ever been mentioned, uh, I should say, in any of the conversations or contact I've had with victims from Concora. Um, but, 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 but I'm really pleased that you have raised it. In my, I mean, I've been in elected politics now for five years. I have never once publicly spoken about Concora as an issue until tonight. And I didn't talk about it during the election campaign, and I didn't talk about it uh, in the run-up uh, to me standing as a Westminster uh, candidate because I was unprepared to criticise such a sensitive issue. Although, of course, uh, it was I am in the constituency for when you were contesting. In, in, my, in my constituency. I have been to the home, uh, as it stands now. I have I've met regularly with uh, some victims. And I know the process and the trauma they're experiencing even going down to Banbridge for the historic constitutional abuse inquiry, which is not sufficient at all. I'll pay tribute both to Naomi Long and to Peter Robinson for the work that they did in trying to get Kinkora uh, into the uh, mainstream inquiry at Westminster. And we all know the importance of it. The importance of it is to get truth about those who uh, have protection as former uh, security officers uh, uh, from the security service, those who are involved in military and those in high up in politics who will not uh, have the truth uncovered about them uh, because of the inability of the local historical institution of abuse inquiry to find that information. So I'm glad you, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked the question. I'm glad that I get the chance now to speak about it and as a member of parliament for East Belfast, I'll not be silent on this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, Colonel Cora, Sinn Féin Republic and Youth. I have a question in particular to uh, Kevin. As a young Gaelgoer from West Belfast, who the language is a very, probably the biggest aspect of my life, I just want to know genuinely why the DUP are so actively and openly against the Irish language, and in particular, at the Gaelic or the Irish Language Act. And strong. Uh, Uh, thanks for the question. I think you're obviously a Gael goer. Uh, you enjoy the Irish language. You've benefited, uh, did you say, from education uh, through uh, the medium of Irish language. Uh, and uh, fair play to you. That's a decision that you've taken. And you are able to enjoy the Irish language and use the Irish language without an Irish language act. I think whenever you need an act, the language is going to die. The fact that you are able to enjoy it, you can work through it, you can be educated by it, you can converse with your friends uh, through the medium of Irish language. We don't need an act. We don't need the cumbersome regulation, we don't need the cost, we don't need the additional burden on our public services through an act. You, sir, are an example of why an act is completely unnecessary. Want to quickly come back on that? Go ahead. I can't uh, go to court and use my native tongue. I cannot go to the hospital and use my native tongue. And if we're talking about expenditure and unnecessary burden on the public pocket, I think today I should come on there something shabby. Yeah. saying is if you can enjoy if you can enjoy what is uh, a pursuit of yours uh, and the decision was taken to educate you uh, in Irish and so on and that has been made available you are you are a shining uh, demonstration of why an act is on this good good on gentlemen here uh, firstly can I just say as a, a person who's been active in the trade union movement for a considerable number of years the first thing I would like to do is uh, congratulate and thank uh, Jeremy Corbyn as being the only candidate of the four contenders who actually voted against the welfare cuts in the House of Commons. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
my actual question, uh, Jeremy, revolves around your, your leadership, or your potential leadership as leader of the Labour Party, and also potentially as the, the leader of the next Labour government. Um, what, what sort of guarantees can you give that the policies of a Corbyn leadership, not just as opposition leader, but as I say, as leader of the governing party, you know, the re-electionisation, public of, of the public utilities, and the privatisation of the NHS, ending austerity, and basically providing uh, a more equal society where the establishment elites hold on, hold on the majority of citizens, be they young or old, uh, and uh, that position is not as, as, as finally so reversed. I'm reverse, finally finally reverse. Reverse. I'm sorry for speaking while you're in the room. No, 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 that's okay. I just want to hurry along. How is, how is Jeremy going to implement this manifesto? Yeah, I think that's all we need to know, Jeremy. Reverse the pattern that's been there for, for centuries. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thank, thanks for your question. I think I'm going to get stopped very quickly if I give you the kind of answer I'd like to give you. <laughs> Because my friend here is uh, kind of English. I haven't even got into the same sentence. You're looking at your watch. Uh, very quickly, I entered this contest because a number of colleagues wanted there to be a real debate in the Labour Party about the direction and policies that we're following. I actually didn't want a leadership contest. I wanted a policy debate. That wasn't to be. We've got a leadership contest, and I'm putting forward a view, and it is my own view, but it's supported by very many other people. One that our economic policy was simply wrong, we were offering austerity light when we should have been opposing austerity and the politics that go with austerity. Secondly, that the numbers of people that have come out and become enthused and interested in this campaign are absolutely stupendous. 1,500 people in a meeting in Liverpool last Saturday night, 2,000 in London a couple of nights ago, and that is multiplied all over the country. Why are they coming out? Two reasons, I believe. One is we do not respond in any way to any personal abuse or personal attack that comes forward. Life is too short for that. I'm more interested in policies than abuse and name-calling. The issues have to be how we deal with the problems that people face all over our society. Secondly, the idea that young people <coughs> are not political is actually complete nonsense. They're turned off... <coughs> excuse me. They're turned off by... Yahoo sucks party politics. They're turned off by presidential style personality and uh, th that style of politics. They're actually passionately interested in environment, peace, their own lives and their own livelihood. And that we're attracting an awful lot of people in. Well, I'll just conclude with this thing. If, uh, whatever the result of the election on September 12th, there's still going to be a big debate about austerity, about democracy within the unions and about the Labour Party. And I don't want us to have the idea that one leader, one parliamentary Labour Party, one person has all the answers to everything. They don't. We need a much more inclusive, collective, bottom-up... Ooh, if you must, you... Why are you so concerned about pragmatism? Because it's a question that's been raised. That was, well, that was about an hour ago. Uh, uh, I can't remember any further back than that. There had, can, let's not go there. Uh, that, there has to be a much more democratic way of doing things in society. And I, I want that to be the case within my own party and within the unions. And whatever the result, this has changed politics. It's changed politics by participation. It's the politics of hope rather than the politics of despair which are offered by greater inequality, pursuit of austerity and pursuit of individual wealth at the expense of the collective good of the whole. That's where I stand. Thank you. I can't remember which said, electability isn't the most important thing. Uh, if uh, Jeremy does become leader of the party, will he be elected as Prime Minister? Was the first word of your sentence Nula? Because I didn't really... <laughs> 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 I tuned out. Yeah. Sorry. Electability isn't the most important thing, said one of the speakers at one of the rallies. I can't remember which one. You yeah. will, Jeremy, I'm sure. Is that the case? Is it not about doing something that will get you elected, no. even if it is demanding of more pragmatism? I didn't go again. <laughs> no, I'm um, uh, 50, 51 and I've lived enough since a young adult to have seen uh, movements and uh, what do you call it, the person who runs the, the governments and um, there's another... Prime Minister? One. Yeah, no, I can't, I, I can't think of the word, but anyway, you know, attitude and uh, movements and stuff like that, they've come and they've gone, they've come and they've gone and I think what I have seen in my lifetime 
You've got the, you know, the out and out George Bush type people, the Margaret Thatcher type people, but more insidious was the Tony Blair um, who said, we need to win, we need to appeal to the common person, the ordinary person, we need to show them aspiration. He swung so far, and I mean, I was there supporting that. So that was far, he got elected three times. He got elected and then lost the run of himself and became, as you said, you know, the, the, the Labour Party became... Uh, well, if this is what the people want, i.e. Toryism and uh, the coalition, well, let's try and do something like that. You will never, I don't know, it depends what you want out of your life. Do you want to be able to go to bed and sleep with, uh, not sleep with yourself? <laughs> do you want to be able to live with yourself? And I mean, Jeremy, I, I just think the point I'm trying to make very badly is everything comes in cycles. I think Jeremy's time is coming, you know, Chucky, how do you say this day will come? Chucky. <laughs> Chucky a la, no doubt, people are fed up to the back teeth with what we have at the moment and the sense of power that there is um, in ordinary people, if Jeremy really can manage well, to do what he want, what he says he'll right. do and not be swayed some, by the smart suits Owen, and the money, right. then he'll Thanks. do better. Oh, and some people will say, uh, fantasy there, that the world is moving towards social dem democratic politics, not towards left-wing politics. Well, what do you think? The key question is, electable by whom? Because what's, been happening, what's been happening in Britain uh, has been mirrored right across Europe, which is the people who vote is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have governments that are actually governing on the basis of 25% of the electorate. Now, some people are saying they're surprised by what they're seeing uh, in London. And in fact, I'm not surprised at all. Because if you look either what's happening in the British or the Labour Party leadership election, what happened in Scotland with the independence referendum, what's happening down south in the right to water protests and the rise of Sinn Féin and others, what's happening in Greece, what's happening in Spain, what you're actually seeing is groups of people who had been uh, consigned as irrelevant by mainstream political parties re-engaging and actually saying, hey, hang on a second, we're also the electorate and we also should have a say in who governs us. And what I would say is, those of us that want the different kind of Ireland or Europe uh, that you can see that hunger for in the huge crowds that Jeremy is getting uh, in, well, in his campaign. 1,500, 2,000 people aren't huge crowds. Well, any definition. I, I'm sorry. Can I say well, this? Can I say this? Go out and organise public meetings in those yeah. communities yeah. at any other well, time of the point. year and you'll get 10, 20 or 30. This crowd is not normal. A thousand five hundred people on a regular basis. Normal, a thousand five hundred people on a regular basis. Exactly. So all I'd say, what I'd say is this: what's happening in the Labour Party uh, uh, leadership election is happening right across Europe. And those of us that uh, are encouraged by that need to get out and do more of it. And then we can reclaim government and politics for the real electorate, not for the increasingly small electorate that elects the mainstream political parties that are pushing the agenda that's hurting people so much. Gavin. The DUP wouldn't support uh, Jeremy Corbyn because of his uh, past stance on matters regarding this part of the world. But leaving that to one side, do you think that Jeremy's day has come? <laughs> well, I think the audience do, and uh, I guess Jeremy will take more comfort from that than from anything I have to say. Um, I think uh, what the Labour Party is experiencing uh, right now in terms of their leadership uh, election, uh, and Jeremy's candidacy particularly, um, mirrors what occurred in Scotland uh, when uh, we had the referendum back in uh, September last year, mirrors what happened in Greece uh, with the referendum, and mirrors what we can see throughout many countries in Europe uh, and indeed the world, and that's where people are putting passion back into politics. Now, if you were to ask me my personal view, I'd say that I have realised that in a lot of these arguments, the heart is winning over the head. Uh, and I would tend, hopefully, to be on the side of the head rather than the heart. But I think you can see that within Labour's uh, leadership election, uh, within Scotland, uh, within Greece, and within many other uh, countries throughout the world, that the heart is winning, and that passion is in politics. And I think uh, Jeremy is uh, as much as that as, as the other cases I've mentioned. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We're going to move as many people as we can here. Jump ahead in the blue shirt. No, no filibusters tonight. No. Um, <laughs> Last night I was at an event uh, at St. Mary's. Um, it was about violence against women with uh, Monica McWilliams, I think, was. And uh, she printed a very stark um, 
picture of what was going on in Northern Ireland and also elsewhere in the world about how women are unsafe in many um, abusive relationships in the home and also elsewhere. What exactly are the parties going to do in Northern Ireland and elsewhere in, in these islands to um, bring about a more safe place for women in the home and also to help women get out of the home where they are being abused? Okay, well let me just go... Something tangible. Let me ask Camilla first of all, do you share that perception and whether you do or not, what would you want to see the parties doing we'll put it to them? Um, I'd like to see fundamental respect for women and their ability to know what's best for themselves and their bodies. <laughs> to see men encouraged to talk about their feelings and to be allowed to Steady be on. <laughs> touch the feminine side, never off the fucking phone. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see a greater sense of men's femininity being appreciated in women's uh, masculinity. If you want to use those crude terms, I'd like us all to be able to talk a little bit more that we're not black and white, prod, take, straight, gay. I think everybody's on a continuum of almost everything most of the time. I'm sure Gavin maybe doesn't agree, but that's fine. Um, I think respect is the big thing and leadership. This is what really pees me off here. People on the street are, are okay, they don't do everything that their political mistresses and masters do and they don't always follow, but we have such a vacuum of good, respectful leadership coming from Stormont uh, at the moment. Our councils do a better job, I think. Our councils With regards specifically to touch. women, you think? I think, I think attitudes to women. Why does somebody think it's okay to slag a woman off for how she looks? Why does the Belfast Telegraph... Uh, boy, I'm not right It's something that's okay to say on the radio, right. uh, talking about women at Stormont. Do you think if they were good looking, we would vote for them? Fuck off, you know? Yeah. How do you, as a legislator, do you change the kind of thing that Nula is protesting about? I think there are, there are two crucial things, uh, and I suppose I'll speak more about the South because that's where I'm involved, but they apply everywhere. The first is we have to stop cutting funding from those support services for women who experience domestic violence. North Amsterdam. And we, need, and we need to increase the investment in those services. But the other thing, and maybe probably more important in terms of tackling the cause of the problem, we need to start talking about masculinity. And we need to actually start addressing the root cause of the problem of domestic violence and violence against women is actually how we as a society think about masculinity, what's acceptable and not acceptable as role models in our schools, in our celebrity And, and, and how as a politician do you bring that and, conversation to and, play? And you do it at every book. available level. So you do it in your schools, through the curricula, you do it in your political system through increasing the representation of women, but it has to be at every level. Violence against women is a problem in the first instance caused by men and particular forms of masculinity and the focus has to be on tackling that. That will take resources, Mula's right, it will take leadership, but I think that's the fundamental shift in the conversation that's required. And I think when we do that, you'll actually start to see society respond in, in a more positive way. Jeremy, what can legislators do? Because obviously we want to get as many questions in as possible. I agree with everything that Nuala just said in the way that she put it. <laughs> two, two, two points, though, just to add, really. One is the question of support, reporting, law, role of the police, women's support centres, rape crisis centres, and an ability for women who are victims, and indeed in some cases men who are victims of domestic violence, to be able to report it and know that it's going to be taken seriously and investigated is very important because if, if that doesn't happen, then others are not going to report. Secondly, it is about education and it is particularly about education and attitudes of boys and young men as to how they treat women, how they respect women, how they deal with their own lives and women's lives in the future. In an extreme situation, but tragically one that is huge, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there are millions of women who are victims of rape where it's been used as a weapon of war. I have visited those places where much of that has happened and I've spoken to a lot of those women who are victims there. And the issue there has to be obviously 
outlawing it as a weapon of war, but also putting a huge amount of effort into the education of boys in how they behave and how they treat people. So the next generation doesn't grow up just as brutal as the current generation. And so it is about education, it is about changing attitudes, and it is also about the way people are perceived in life. The point you made about why are women candidates for election judged by their appearance, whereas um, wizened people like me are not judged by their appearance, only by whether they put pens in their top pocket or not. <laughs> uh, you know, let's be serious about it. We have to move into a society where there is greater understanding, greater respect, and that starts in schools, starts with attitudes, starts with education. We're going to have to stop it. We have reached our deadline. Uh, I'm so sorry I didn't get everyone's question. I tried to get it around the hall as much as I could. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And a big